Well, good evening, everybody. Um, first, I want to start off by saying I have switched locations. I am doing this from home. Uh, was scrambling to find everything that I needed to uh, set it up, but uh, so I'm a little bit discombobulated, but ready to get into this uh, next lesson in the book of Esther. So um, hope that you have already printed off your notes so that you can follow along. And uh, we're going to get started. I'm going to start off uh, by talking about a uh, commentary, a uh, guy named Landon Down, that I've mentioned his name before, I uh, have really enjoyed his commentary as well, and he has an interesting uh, interesting character that he wants to introduce uh, that has nothing to do with the book of Esther, uh, but is very interesting for us to see. So um, we're, we're calling tonight's lesson The Fall of Pride, and uh, Landon Dowden brings up the, uh, the story of Wiley e. Coyote, and I know growing up, I, split, I spent plenty of Saturday mornings watching Looney Tunes, watching Wile E. Coyote ch chase the Roadrunner. And so uh, I'm certainly very familiar with this. So um, Dowden shares similarities between Haman, who is uh, the main antagonist in our story in, in the book of Esther, and with Wile E. Coyote. He, he goes on to say, poor Wile E. Coyote, in so many Saturday mornings of cartoon watching, I witnessed his, his incessant and insane attempts to capture or kill the Roadrunner. He, however, was never able to dine on what he desired. Unbeknown to him, Wild E would never be allowed to achieve his aim. The cartoon's creator, Chuck Jones, had a list of nine rules to be applied to every episode. Among those rules were these. Number one, the Roadrunner cannot harm the coyote except by going beep beep. And who did not go around the rest of the morning uh, making this sound to the annoyance of his or her parents? Number two, no outside force can harm the coyote, only his own ineptitude or the failure of the Acme products that he used. Number three, the coyote could stop any time if he were not a fanatic. And number four, that, uh, that Dowden mentions out of the nine, the coyote is always more humiliated than harmed by his failures. And we certainly saw that play out time and time again, Saturday morning after Saturday morning. And so um, I, I thought that was such an appropriate uh, thing for him to mention as he's describing Haman. We certainly see it play out, uh, especially in, in the lesson that we're getting into right now. So uh, we, will, we will actually dive right in. And uh, I would encourage you to pay attention to maybe some of those four rules that was in place for Wile E. Coyote and maybe see how similar they are for Haman as he, uh, as he goes out trying to, well, in this case, he's already tried to do so many different things, and now he's going to, in a way, get what he has coming, some people might say. So uh, turning our Bibles to Esther, Esther chapter 6, we're going to finish off with the last verse of chapter 6, and then we're going to go through the entire chapter of chapter 7. So uh, Esther 6, 14, it says, while they were yet talking with him, this is talking about Haman's family, his friends, his wife. If you remember, he was pretty despondent after having to lead um, lead Mordecai around the city and, and, and uh, basically show him honor. So um, if you remember last week, his friends and family were giving him some bad advice. But while they were yet talking with him, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried to bring Haman to the feast that Esther had prepared. Uh, we, again, we've known for the last couple of chapters, she had prepared a banquet and they had uh, sent Haman, sent the king away uh, with the plans to do a second banquet. And so uh, the time has come for that. Uh, chapter 7, starting in verse 1, it says, So the king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. And on the second day, as they were drinking wine after the feast, the king again said to Esther, What is your wish, Queen Esther? It shall be granted you. And what is your request? Even to the half of my kingdom, it shall be fulfilled. So again, we, we go back to this theme that we saw uh, back in chapter 5 as, as we were going through and 
Um, as Esther was putting her plan into motion, she had, had approached the king from afar, entering into the inner court, uh, certainly at, at great peril for herself, uh, knowing that she really shouldn't do that without being invited. She is spared by the king, and she puts this plan into motion. So uh, pretty interesting chain of events. So again, you have that, that first banquet. She's very, very um, tactful in, in approaching the king at first and uh, prepares this banquet and, and really uh, takes to serving the king, serving Haman, almost like buttering him up in a way. And, and then we have the interlude that we saw in most of chapter six uh, with the dream that the king has, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, sleepless night that the king has and then he rediscovers Mordecai's bravery in saving him from a plot and, and uh, what goes on from there. So interesting stuff there. Um, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So as we begin talking about uh, this second banquet and looking at some of the details that we find in there, um, we, again, it says in verse 14 that we just read, immediately following Haman's interaction with his wife and friends, where he was warned of impending destruction. Remember that his wife, who in chapter 5 had said that, that he would go on to great things, and at the end of chapter 6 says, if Mordecai, basically if Mordecai has been elevated, Haman will fall, and we're going to see that uh, play out in this chapter. On the second day, and I just wanted to make sure, depending on the translation that you're reading, uh, this may seem a bit out of place. And, and so I just wanted to mention it real, real quick. Um, it, it's one of those things, remember that uh, Esther had done a banquet, the, the first banquet, and then she the request at the end of that banquet was for them to come back the next day, the second day. And so, again, this is just referring back to that thing. It's, it's connecting the plan together with what's actually happening. Uh, so this isn't a, a second day of feasting uh, like we saw a play out in chapter 1. Uh, this is just more detail talking about the second day. And then, uh, again, we, it seems like this has played out so many times over the last couple of chapters. Um, we, you know, it's almost... It's almost to the point where you get tired of hearing this, but uh, again, you have um, you you have the king asking Esther, "Hey, wh what do you want?" Uh, you know, she she comes to the court and he asks, "What do you want?" And she says, "Hey, come to the dinner that I'm going to make." And so him and Haman show up, and after they've eaten, after they've drank some wine, uh, "Hey, what do you want? What do you want?" And and the request, you, you again, you expect that she's going to reveal the plot against the Jews, but instead she says, "Hey." Come back tomorrow night to another banquet that I'm going to prepare for you. And so this has been playing out, you know, just leading on the king for, for quite a while here. And so finally, he, he gets back to that question. He wants to know why Esther would have risked her life to, to come before him. And so, uh, again, you have this idea. Uh, there's something that plays out. There's a little bit of poetry uh, the, the way that this is written. When the king asks Esther again after uh, after this meal, uh, there's a little bit of Hebrew poetry going on or, or the way it's written. Um, you have uh, an AB, AB structure to the writing here when, when the king asks, what is your wish? That is the A. And then uh, it will be granted is the B part. And then he goes on to say, what is your request? Again, an A. And then it shall be fulfilled. So he's repeating this. He's, he's emphasizing the fact that he wants to know what she wants, and he wants her to know that he is willing to grant her wish. And, and so just making that very, very clear. All right, let's get back into the story. Uh, we're going to go down to verses 3 and 4 real quick. Um, people freezing up, anything uh, not working right? I'm, I'm trying to read the comments as I go to juggling that as well. So um, I, t I tell you, I'm... Uh, so much happier with a little bit better internet myself. So uh, hopefully, hopefully you guys are okay. Um, so back to Esther chapter 7 now. In, in verse 3 it says, Then Queen Esther, again, she has just been asked again by the king. And so she re replies, she answers, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be granted me for my wish and my people for my request. For we have been sold, this is verse 4, for we have been sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be killed, 
and to be annihilated. If we had been sold merely as slaves, men and women, I would have been silent, for our affliction is not to be compared with the loss to the king. Now there's a there's some very interesting things that are going on here and, and even trying to figure out exactly what's being said. Um, we, we certainly uh, need to spend a little bit of time uh, on what's going on here. And, and so what we find, let, let's first spend some time with uh, verse 3 there. As Esther is talking about, uh, again, she's using this language, and we pointed this out uh, week after week, um, how important it was for Esther to find favor, to be pleasing. Remember, uh, early on, she is uh, described as being very beautiful. She is being described as somebody that is uh, obedient to Mordecai, and that type of attitude is pleasing to the king. And so this is played out uh, for most of what we have seen out of Esther in this book. And so, again, she goes back to that mantra. She goes back to that same attitude here. And so, finally, we get to the point where she is ready to make her request. And she starts off with some pleasant, uh, pleasantries. And, and so, simply, she says, if I have found favor, and she also says, if it pleases the king. Again, she is seeking his favor. She is seeking, wanting to make sure that what she requests, what she is wanting, the, the fact that he is willing to grant a wish is going to please him. He is doing it because it pleases him to do this thing for the queen. And so, again, uh, there, there's another poetic structure to this, by the way. Uh, when you go through this part, we just saw in, in the king and the way that he had structured um, what he was presenting to the queen and how he is asking her again what she wants. He used a model of A, B, A, B. I know this is probably getting uh, pretty deep and nerdy uh, when you're looking at uh, the structure of these sentences. But, but again, the king uses A, B, A, B. What you find here in Queen Esther's response is she is going to use a structure that is A, A, B, B. She starts off by, if I have found favor and if it pleased the king. Then she goes on to the actual uh, requests. She goes on to the actual uh, what, what the bottom dollar is here. She is asking for her life. She says, my life and my people. Again, if you go back to that, she, she's saying, if I have found favor and if it pleases the king, she's asking for her life because she recognizes that under the decree that Haman had crafted, that she was facing certain destruction. So she is asking for her life, but she is going way beyond that. And she is asking for the lives of her people as well. Landon Dowden, he says that Esther's opportunity to present her request is one more attempt to persuade the king to act. Uh, and again, the author portrays uh, Ahasuerus. I know a lot of people want me to pronounce it a different way, so there's another way to, to pronounce the king's name. Ahasuerus as tossed about by the whims of whoever has his attention. And this is going to play out in this chapter. Remember that we've talked many, many times about the fact that anything that the king was doing in this book, from chapter one, when he is, uh, when he is um, refused, when Vashti refuses to, to do what he tells her, he seeks advice. He calls together his advisors to find out what needs to be done. In chapter two, when it comes time to find a new queen, he seeks advice from uh, young men around him. Hey, how should I handle this? And so uh, constantly we have seen that he is indecisive. We have seen that he is dependent on advisors. And, and so in a way, this plays out again as he is asking Esther what she wants. He is waiting to be influenced by her request. And, and so again, that, that character, uh, I don't know if you'd call it a character flaw or not, uh, but it, sure, it certainly has uh, presented itself as a problem uh, throughout this book for the king. Um, so uh, again, you have this uh, interaction that he is having, and she finally asks for her life and for the lives of her people. She is trying to influence the king to make a decision. She goes on in verse four, as we look at that, uh, she goes on to talk about exactly what has transpired, what has happened uh, that is so important that she has to deal with this. And so first, she points out that the people were sold to be destroyed. She wants to make it clear to the king that 
that the threat is very serious. It's, it's not something that, hey, somebody stole my lunch money. No, it's much more serious than this. Um, the, the people, her people, her and her people were sold to be destroyed, to be annihilated, to be killed. As a matter of fact, she uses exact language that Haman used in crafting that decree that condemned the Jewish people. And, and so, you know, I, I almost get a sense that as she is using this exact language, I wonder to myself, does Haman, who is right there, does, does he start to get an inkling of what's going on? Does he start to recognize what's happening or if, is he completely oblivious? Um, that, that would be an interesting thing to, to maybe be in the room and see what's going on. Uh, here, here's a difficult one to deal with, by the way. Esther goes on to talk about the, the, the seriousness of the situation. And she mentions that if it was merely because her people were going to be sold into slavery, she would not have bothered the king. Now, certainly we can understand it as we look at the two possibilities. The, the possibility of a people group becoming slaves or them being completely destroyed, killed, annihilated. There's a difference. There's a huge difference. And so uh, Esther is, is right in pointing out that uh, this is a serious threat that her people face. And so she is coming to the king because, you know, in just a few months time when this decree is supposed to take place, these people are, are supposed to be killed. These people are supposed to be completely wiped out. There's no going back. And so she had mentioned that if, if maybe they had been sold into slavery, maybe she says that she wouldn't have bothered the king about it. Uh, and she mentions this, this idea of wealth. She mentions this idea of that, that she wouldn't want to cost the king any money. And, and I want to mention... I know that when we talk about slavery, especially in our time, in our day, in this country, with our experiences and our history with slavery, I know that we have a, a different view of it. And, and I don't want us to forget that. I don't want us to ignore that. But I want to make sure that when we are looking at Esther's comments, when we look at what she is trying to say, I want us to understand that she is not minimizing slavery. She is not minimizing, especially our country's experience with it. She's not trying to minimize any of that. She is simply trying to point out the dire situation that the Jewish people are in. You know, it, it, it's almost as if, you know, she's pointing out that this is the worst of the worst. This is the worst thing that could happen. And so she she's wanting to make sure that the king understands the threat, the, the seriousness of what is going on. And, and so she does that. And she she's also kind of, she's playing to the king a little bit too. If you remember when Haman had gone to the king, when Haman had first gone and, and, and talked about forming this decree to condemn the Jewish people, remember, he did not mention who it was. He did not mention uh, what specific people group it was. He just mentioned it vaguely a, a group of people, a, a people, you know, and, and he goes on to describe them as not profitable, not somebody that needed to be in the empire. It was going to cost the king money to have them around. And so he really manipulated the king. Haman manipulates him and, and really is conniving. He Remember, he offers him 10,000 talents of silver. So this, I mean, just this huge sum of money uh, to help pass this through and to get permission to do this. And then uh, he really uh, schemes and, and tries to convince the king that the Jews are actually costing the king money. And so here you have Esther, she's refuting that argument. She's really uh, trying to point out that, hey, if, you know, if, if this was more serious, I mean, what was less serious, I wouldn't want to do this because, king, I know how important it is to protect your wealth and to protect your power base. And, and so she mentions that she's not willing to do this simply on a whim or on something any less important. So Again, I uh, just wanted to talk about that for just a moment. I um, just want to make sure and go through my notes here. Um, yeah, Tomasino, Anthony Tomasino in, in his commentary, he points out that the king likely would not have been concerned about a people group 
because he did not perceive it to affect him directly. And I think we can understand that, right? You know, there's so many people that, you know, you, we, we have commercials on TV nowadays. You know, we, we've all seen the, we've all seen the animal, um, the animal commercials, the dogs, the sad, you know, it's sad music and, you know, it's just the worst conditions. And so it's really tugging at your heartstrings. We've all seen the, the commercials for, for the poor and the hungry, you know, especially these different ministries that serve in Africa. And, and so we've seen so much of that stuff and we understand that the reason that they have those commercials the reason they have those pictures and those videos is because they want people to see what's going on they want people to be able to identify with the issue and so what you have here Tomasino is trying to point out when it comes to the king you know Haman has crafted this decree to condemn the Jewish people. And he it's likely that the king isn't gonna have a care in the world. He's not gonna know who the people are. He's not gonna realize that he has any direct connections to these people. So he's carefree. He, he doesn't mind. It's not going to affect him directly. But what, what you find out happens, what you see here, especially at the second banquet, when Esther begins to confront and, and to address the real issue Tomasino goes on to say, even though, so it has not directly affected the king, at least he's perceived that to be the way. Now Esther connects the threat against the Jews to herself, identifying as a Jew for the first time to the king, and thereby making the threat against the Jews personal to the king as a threat against his queen. And so again, that's an important point. I really appreciated uh, that commentary pointing that out. Again, this guy's completely oblivious. He's in the palace. He really doesn't have to deal with the day-to-day -day stuff. And all of a sudden, this threat against the Jews becomes real because his wife is Jewish. His wife is threatened by this. So uh, he has to use great care in that. All right. Um, I want to read a quote to you from Anthony Tomasino. I, I know I quote him a lot. Uh, but this goes back to this idea that we talked about when it came to Esther's comment about slavery and affecting the king's wealth. Uh, Tomasino, he says, the financial loss would represent the lost income from taxation as well as services that the Jews might provide. Haman had argued that the king should not put up with the Jews because they were not profitable. Esther argues here that the loss of the Jews will represent a financial blow to the king that Haman has not adequately compensated. In a way, what Tomasino is saying here is that Haman has swindled the king. You know, he Haman paid 10,000 talents, and that's a ton of money. You know, quite literally, that's a lot of money. And But when you consider the, the effects that the Jews are going to have on the economy of Persia at that time, I mean, it's, it's small. It, it's really... Uh, it, it doesn't even compare. And so, uh, again, I think that's an important point when you get into the details and see exactly uh, what Haman was doing here. All right, let's move on. I, we're we're going to have a lot of questions in, in, in the rest of the lesson tonight. So I'm hoping that you guys have your typing fingers loosened up. I hope that you're ready to answer some of these as we go through. Uh, it looks like we're having a really... Uh, good luck with the uh, internet. So again, I hope that we can get through this and and uh, have some interaction here. I know I've been talking a lot. All right, Esther chapter 7, verse 5 now. It says, then king, oh, Phil, I did it once and now I, I can't remember. Uh, Ahasuerus, then king Ahasuerus said to queen Esther, who is he and where is he who has dared to do this? So instantly, uh, Esther is finally revealing the plot, but she hasn't pointed out who. And, and, and it's an interesting interaction here, and I think there's some interesting things for us to see here. But the king says to Esther, who is he? Where is he? Who has dared to do this? He is seeing the threat. It has become personal to him, and he needs to deal with it. So the question, who is he? Well, the first thing he's asking, who sold the Jews to be destroyed? Who is the one responsible for this? And the king, uh, what, I, what I sense here is that the king, his sense of justice has been aroused. He, he is recognizing this horrible plot. He's recognizing this horrible thing that's about to take place. And so he's mad. You know, he wants to do something about this. 
And so he has the, his sense of justice it is stirred up and he wants to go do something about it. And it really, it should remind us of the story, much like King David was incensed. Remember how angry King David got when Nathan comes and tells him a story about a rich man stealing from a poor man. And, and, and how horrible that was and how angry King David got. It's similar here. The king, he, he is having his emotions stirred up and he wants to do something about it. All right, so I think that those are some important things for us to recognize in the king. Now, before we get on to uh, verse six, I think it's interesting that really the king kind of gets a free pass, doesn't he? I, I, you know, I want to know, I'm wondering, why isn't the king implicated? And, and this is one I'd love for you guys to comment on Facebook as you're watching. You know, what, what is the reason why the king is not impl implicated in this? And the reason I bring that up is because simply remember that Haman goes to the king. He makes a case, hey, there's this group of people. They're no good for you. Give me permission. I'll pay you 10,000 talents of silver. He gives, the, the king gives Haman his signet ring. He gives him permission to go and craft this decree. So although the king did not directly do this, he's still responsible. And, and so again, I'm, I'm curious as to why would the king not be implicated in this? Um, Kind of stalling a little bit, hoping uh, somebody might have a, a comment that we can have. Um, <laughs> Tony has asked the same question. Yep, it's it's a good question to ask. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else before we move on and maybe address this a little bit? All right, we will come back to this then. Um, feel free to comment. Um, Hopefully I will see it and come back to it. But let's go back and read verse 6 now and, and let's see uh, what Esther has to say as, um, as she finally reveals what's going on. So again, the, the king is asked in verse 5, Who is it? Who is he? And where is he? And Esther said, A foe and enemy. This wicked Haman... And, and I could just imagine the scene. I don't know if you do this as you're reading. Maybe you have, you know, the scene plays out in your mind as you're reading. But I think it's interesting that she, maybe she's walking around and, and you know, it's almost like this dramatic play, right? She's walking around and this wicked Haman, as she points out dramatically to the man that has crafted this scheme. And immediately after she says this, verse six says, then Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. Well, of course, he should be terrified, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> Phil says kings thought of themselves as God as we uh, consider why he wouldn't have been implicated. Um, yeah, I, I think there's a, a lot of reasons. Um, I, so here's an important one as we, as we get back to this idea. So she's just identified Haman. And I think it's important that we see even in this that she does not implicate the king. She does not say, hey, king, husband, you're the one that gave him permission to do this. You're the one that's responsible. You are the one that took 10,000 talents of silver in exchange for this decree. You know, how do you think that would play out? You know, I think one of the reasons why he's not implicated is quite frankly, if he was implicated, if she approaches this in the wrong way, What's, what's he going to do? He, we, we saw in chapter one that he wasn't pleased with his wife Vashti, deposes her. I think she's lucky that she wasn't executed. You know, he certainly has that power. Um, and, and so she really has to step lightly. She has to be very delicate in how she addresses this. And certainly if you start accusing this guy of, of all of his implications, I mean, it, it could be factual. Uh, technically true, but it's not going to achieve what she needs to achieve. And so she really has to be careful in, in what's going on. Um, looks like it's freezing up for me, guys. I hope that it's not freezing up for you as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, so Esther, she finally identifies. So, so for about three chapters, we've been waiting uh, we've been hoping for this, and we've been wanting this to happen. And so here it is. It's finally happened. Haman accused. She comes out. She says it. Uh, a foe and an enemy. She's identifying 
how despicable, how you know, diametrically opposed. Remember that we spent a little bit of time looking at the characters of Mordecai and Haman, how you know, Mordecai the Jew, Haman the Amalekite, and, and I mean, generations and generations before them, how they had been um, mortal enemies. And, and so it plays out again here, a foe and an enemy. Uh, this wicked Haman finally, finally to the point where she directly points out, you know, points out the guy, you know, just like that courtroom scene you've seen on so many movies, him right here, this wicked Haman, it's finally out in the open. And of course, the result of that is Haman is absolutely terrified. And, and so, um, and, and it's right that, that he feels that way. Ian Duguid, I, man, he's got an interesting name. I really don't know how to pronounce that one at all. But he notes, Esther's intricate plan was a necessary part of the process of bringing Haman to justice, a plan that required a combination of subtlety, boldness, and strength to carry it through. One can be shrewd without being sinful, and Esther carefully walked that line. Now, I think that's a great comment that he's making, especially as we look at, at, at this whole scene as a whole. Uh, I think we do need to use caution, though, as we see how this all plays out, uh, because I think that there are some things that are a little questionable, and I've actually got it on here, so we'll, we'll see that in just a minute. All right. Uh, getting back to Esther chapter 7, verse 7 this time. I know we're going a verse at a time, but I wanted to make sure that we uh, were able to cover enough of the detail here. So verse 7. Now this is after Esther has finally pointed out Haman as the culprit. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the play to the palace garden rather. But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. And, and so uh, this is not playing out. This is not surprising at all uh, what we see going on. And so, uh, again, the king arose in his wrath. I think that is an interesting uh, play. That's something that's interesting. Uh, so Haman, he, he's going to beg for mercy. But uh, here's a question for you, and there's, there's a couple here that we can address. Why does the king leave? Why does the king bug out of there? You know, he, he is just, he has been waiting in, in real time. He's been waiting two days. He's, you know, he had Esther show up and uh, he grants a request. Hey, come to dinner tonight. They show up for that. Okay, what do you want? Hey, come to dinner tomorrow night. So over the course of two days, he's really been waiting. I, I would imagine a little bit impatiently to hear what she has wanted. And, and so she elaborates on this plot to kill her and her people. And his first response, as she has pointed out the culprit, he leaves. He walks out of the scene. And, and so it's curious, why would he do this? Why would he... Uh, why would he bug out like this? The second question is, why does Haman beg the queen? Um, that's an interesting turn. Again, we, we were just talking about this idea. Um, I all sobered up really quick. Yeah, that's a good point, Alan, as they're finishing up this meal and uh, <laughs> things are laid bare, aren't they? Uh, yeah, that'll, that'll get their attention. So, why does Haman beg the queen? Why does the king leave? I think those are important questions for us to ask. I was just talking about the fact that uh, you have the Jews and, and Mordecai and certainly Esther and Haman being a Malachite who is a, um, just a mortal enemy of the Jews. And, and so you have this turn. Haman starts begging the queen. And, and so it's interesting. And then you have this, this irony that plays out. And, and so I think it's, it's important for us to, to look at these things. So um, I, I know you guys are having problems. I Man, I'm, I'm really disappointed that it's freezing up, but um, any idea? Maybe he feels played by both Esther and Haman. Um, yeah, that, you know what? I hadn't considered that. Meredith, that's a great point. Why does the king leave? Esther says maybe he feels played by both Esther and Haman. Uh, that is an interesting thing, and, and it actually, that could play into uh, one of the things that I was reading about um, so I will mention that in just a second. Wanted to see if anybody else uh, had any comments on there. Um, why does the king leave? Um, okay. 
Yeah, answering the question, Tony's answering the question, why does Haman beg the queen? And he says, the king has shown he values the queen over all others so she could sway the king. Basically, the queen could go and beg for Haman's life uh, on behalf of Haman. Okay. Um, yep. Uh, Meredith is uh, commenting on the same question. Uh, why does Haman beg the queen? Uh, Haman has seen that Esther has tact to perhaps persu persuade the king to spare his life. I want you guys to keep these comments in the back of your mind, by the way, because I think uh, when we get here uh, to a couple more slides and start asking you know, uh, about what happened and why it happened, I, I think it's important that we, um, that we wonder why it played out the way that it plays out. <clears throat> so l let me answer the question here. Why does the king leave? Now, I want you to pay attention to something. Remember, and I mentioned this earlier, in chapter one, he is deposing Vashti, or actually he's angry with Vashti, and he asks advisors, all right? And so he sought advice in how to deal with Vashti. In chapter two, when he is lamenting the fact, when he is missing his now former wife, his former queen, he is given advice to have a beauty contest, essentially. And so he follows through with that. And then when Haman, when he is disrespected, he, Haman is elevated to a high office and then disrespected by Mordecai. The king is influenced by Haman, who is now his chief advisor, uh, to craft this decree to annihilate the Jewish people. And so uh, if you see a common denominator in all this, it is the fact that the king has made it clear that he depends on advisors. He needs the advice of others in order to do anything. And so there's a lot of, lot of the commentaries that I read were speculating that the king steps away simply because he would normally seek advice and he has no one that he, that he has available to advise him. His chief advisor has just been accused of wanting to kill his wife and his queen. And so he's probably gathering himself. He's probably trying to figure out what to do. Maybe he's getting on a cell phone out there and trying to find, you know, the next wise man, the next advisor that he can find. Who knows uh, what he's doing out there? I, I believe he's collecting himself. I think it's a lot to take. He has really opened himself up to be influenced by Esther. And so this is where I think the comment that uh, he, he doesn't know what to make of both of them, I think that that really plays into it because he depends so much on Haman as an advisor and he really wanted to please his wife and so he's caught in the middle. Um, just reading some comments here. Um, the other question, why does Haman beg the queen? And I think you guys have, you've hit it on the head, absolutely. He is looking for her to now influence the king. Certainly he, re it says it in, the, in verse seven, that he recognizes that the king means to eliminate him, means to execute him. He knows that he cannot approach the king. He has no, uh, he has no ability to go and influence the king anymore. And so he turns to the queen and tries to get her to influence or her to speak on behalf of Haman so that maybe he can be spared. Uh, just an interesting play, how, how this all worked out. Uh, so here's something interesting. We've, we've got to verse seven, and, and I wanted to point something out. This is something that, that hopefully if you were sharp and you're looking, that both Esther and Haman have a similar experience in this chapter. And do, do you, did you see what it was? Both Esther and Haman have begged for their lives in this chapter. When Esther finally reveals her request, when she says that my life, she is asking for her life from the king, she is begging for her life. She is asking the king to spare her life and her people. And then here in verse seven, as Haman has been revealed, he begins to beg of Esther. So I thought that was interesting that you have this, this um, mini motif, so to speak, that plays out. Uh, Esther and Haman are both begging for their lives. Landon Dowden, he says that Haman was pleading for mercy, and this is an interesting, uh, uh, certainly his character. He is pleading for mercy, though he had been unwilling to extend any. He had not been willing to give anybody any mercy, and here he is begging for mercy. Uh, all right, so um, let's go on to verse 8. Uh, hopefully everything's working well. Uh, we're keeping up with everybody here. So uh, Esther... 7 verse 8. This is after the, the king has departed and Haman is begging the queen 
for some support. It says, And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine. They had been previously drinking wine. As Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. And the king said, Will he even assault the queen in my presence in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. And they being the attendants, the eunuchs that would uh, be there for the king and the queen. And, and so, uh, man, he comes back and, and sees the scene play out. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting. Okay, so here's, here's the moral dilemma. Here's the questions that I have. And we'll play into this just a little bit deeper here in the next slide as well. So here you have, we understand in verse 7 that Haman now approaches Esther. He is begging for his life, essentially, begging for mercy from her, wanting her to influence the king on his behalf. And the king walks in and he sees Haman and, and it appears that Haman is falling onto this couch. Maybe he is, maybe he is physically grabbing Esther, trying to get her to uh, ask for mercy on his behalf. We don't know for sure. It doesn't give us a, a lot of detail. But the question is, is he begging at this point when the king comes back? Or is he assaulting the queen as the king accuses him of? And so, uh, so you have the king returns and sees Haman doing this thing. And, and so the question is, what is Haman actually doing? What is he, is he actually assaulting? Is he just begging? Is he, is, is he I mean, just, he, he knows that he's facing death. He's no, he knows that execution is the next step in his life and he's, he's just gonna do everything that he can to try and preserve his life. Or is he actually assaulting the queen? Is he, has he been enraged all over again and wants to take her life, do bad things to her, as the king uh, supposes he's doing. And so finally, the, the last question on the slide here, what does it mean that they covered Haman's face? What does it mean that they covered Haman's face? Uh, there's a couple of things we'll, we will look at here in, in just a minute. So uh, let me read through some of the notes here. Um, again, is, is this a misunderstanding on the king's part? As we are going through here and we're trying to understand and, and, and get a sense of what is going on, is the king being upstanding in this? Uh, Tony says that Haman is likely begging, blubbering. He is really doing everything he can to save his life. Um, not that one. So here's, uh, there's several commentaries, and I want to point this out. So uh, Anthony Tomasino, in his commentary, he points out that Haman's actions in seeking the favor of the queen and trying and begging for mercy of the queen probably broke protocol, perhaps by throwing himself on the queen to beg for mercy or by merely being too close to her. And there's some evidence that uh, from several ancient Near East cultures, that show coming within seven paces of a member of a king's harem was a capital crime. And so uh, this may be something that's playing out. He got too close to the queen, he's in big trouble. Um, there's also um, speculation, again, we, we don't know if he's actually trying to assault the, the queen or not. I, I, I'm telling from my opinion, I don't think that he is assaulting the queen. I think that he is doing everything that he possibly can to beg for his life you know he, he's wanting to he's wanting to receive mercy and so he's getting too close he's very very adamant blubbering as tony says really wanting to to go and and save his own life whoops so there's this other side of things that i wanted to talk about here um and, and it was the last question on the slide what does it mean that they covered Haman's face phil wood says they put a bag over his head well, the, the actual act, yeah, that's what they're doing. They're putting a the bag over his head. Um, so why, what are they doing here? Is there some type of significance? Is there some symbolism at play? And so Tomasino has, a, has an opinion on this as well. And uh, he thinks that um, he wants to show the importance of the act of covering Haman's head. Although it is not something recorded in other sources of Persian history, it is used in this story, listen to this, to signify the ultimate shame of Haman and the finality of his fate. And I think that's an important 
part uh, of what's going on here. Um, he also, Thomasino also uh, wants to make the connection between Haman's story here in the fact that he's covered and the story and acts of Ananias and Sapphira. If you remember, they were trying to cheat, basically trying to cheat the Holy Spirit. They had sold some property and they brought only a portion of the money of the proceeds and they only brought some of it, but they passed it off as if they were giving everything. And so uh, they fell dead right on the spot and they are covered. And, and again, it's, it's this idea of, of covering up their shame and there's a finality to it. So there were some similarities in that that I thought was interesting. Um, but again, I think ultimately, uh, go back to chapter six, when Haman was forced to parade Mordecai through the city. When, when he's going through here, he is mortified at the end of this. You know, he's, he's finished up doing this horrible thing. He, he would expect this honor to go to himself. And instead, he has to do this for Mordecai. And so you remember, when he goes home, he covers his head. And again, that is a sign of shame and humiliation. And, and so it goes, uh, it, you have this play out again in chapter 7, although this time it's going to be much, much worse for him. Absolutely, Meredith, yes, they are marking him for death. I, I think that is exactly right. All right. Um, morally questionable. So th this is what I wanted to have a conversation or at least bring up so you can have the conversation about this. So when we are looking at this, uh, at what just played out in, in the fact that, that Esther has finally identified Haman as, as the culprit. He's the one that has crafted uh, this scheme to eliminate the Jews. You know, that, that's all on the up and up. And, and so the king doesn't know what to do. The king is incensed. He's enraged. He, he steps out, uh, most likely to collect himself, to think about what to do. And when he comes back, you have, the, you have Haman that is either way too close to the queen, says, you know, falling over the couch. So maybe he's falling over and onto her. And what does he say? He says, is basically, is Haman going to assault the queen? in my own house while I'm home? Like, you know, he's building up this case. And, and so immediately when these words come out of the king's mouth, Haman is covered. They, they cover his head. And, and, you know, if you've read ahead, maybe you're familiar with the story, you know what's going to happen with Haman. But the, some commentators, a lot of commentators have a problem with this. They, they have a problem with what's playing out here. And so they raise concerns about the actions of the queen, or I'm sorry, actions of the king and the inaction of Esther. The king accuses Haman of assaulting the queen, and it, and it really doesn't seem like that's what was actually happening. And the queen does nothing to correct the misinterpretation. You know, she it, it seems like she has grown by leaps and bounds. She's really coming into her own especially, you know, with some uh, moral stands that she has taken uh, for the Jewish people. And here you see that she's not willing to do that. She doesn't do anything to preserve his life. And, and you know, I think a lot of us will feel like, hey, Haman, Haman's getting what he has coming to him. And, and I think we even take delight in this story, in this chapter. Uh, you know, this is, uh, it's been building up to this point uh, for quite a while now. And you get to this point. And as you're reading, man, so many of us are just going to be excited. Like, yeah, he's finally getting what he has coming to him. And it's understandable. But I think when you look at the Christian ethic, when you look at how we're actually supposed to be, we shouldn't delight in anybody's destruction. You know, we, we really should be uh, people who are trying to bring people back to reconciliation with God. And, and so, uh, again, there are a lot of people, a lot of things that I read really had a problem with uh, the king's action here. Certainly, we understand he's not a Christian. He's not a Jew. He doesn't abide by the same religious rules that we do. Uh, but certainly Esther is trying to live by these. And, and so her actions are... Uh, maybe a little bit more culpable in this. Uh, so I, I thought it was interesting. I wanted to talk about it, wanted to bring it up, and uh, maybe you guys can have uh, a discussion at home about this and, and talk about what you think. Um, so, you know, basically, is the king making a false accusation in order to achieve his goal of executing Haman? You know, I think that is very possible. Uh, Tomasino says it is difficult to reconcile Esther's actions in Esther 7 as righteous. He accuses the queen, this is uh, Tomasino, is accusing the queen of remaining silent when the king accuses Haman of rape or assault at the end of the chapter. 
The fate of Haman is achieved through scrupulous means, and Tomasino wonders if the ends in this case justify the means. And, and that's a great point. It's a great question. And, and really, I think, man, that's real life right there. That is, it really is. It, it's difficult. It's a, it's a hairy situation. How does it really play out? What should be our response? And so I think that's something that we could really spend some time uh, talking about and trying to figure out. All right. We've got a couple more verses left, and then we've got some final thoughts. So uh, I know we, we need to try and wrap it up here pretty quick. So uh, back to Esther chapter 7, uh, verse 9 and 10. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the uh, in attendance on the king, said, "Moreover, the gallows that Haman has prepared for Mordecai, whose words saved the king, is standing at Haman's house, fifty cubits high." Remember, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, or last when when Haman was building this, fifty cubits high. That's seventy-five feet. That's taller than a four-story building. He's building this gallows. He goes on to say, and the king said, hang him on that. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king abated. All right. So again, I think it's it's pretty interesting. I think, you know, you know, for the most part, we see it as, as uh, justified. Uh, again, we see it as Haman got what he had coming. And I think there's some interesting things that we see finally play out. You know, it's, I don't know how many of you, this, this thought just came to my mind. I was, uh, I, I loved reading Harry Potter books when they were coming out. I know I'm too old for that, uh, but whatever. Uh, so I remember one of the books when they have this teacher um, that, that comes along and she is just evil. And the actress that plays her in the movies did such a fine job. But I remember reading that book and being so completely frustrated throughout that entire book, just waiting for that woman to get what she had coming. And it took forever. I mean, the, the, the author, J.K. Rowling, did a wonderful job in building up that frustration in the reader. And it took forever, but finally at the end, you have this, this, um, this event that happens. She finally gets uh, what she has coming. It's you know basically justice. And, and there's this relief that happens. And, and so I, I think that you, in this story, you kind of see that th same thing play out here. So the irony of pride, I want to talk about this because Haman, uh, again, all of the things that he was really wanting to have for his life, this wealth, this power, this influence, and, you know, he wanted people to bow down to him. He wanted to get richer. He wanted to be more powerful. And he ends up having to honor Mordecai instead. And, and so again, this irony that he, he built this gallows for Mordecai, and now he is the one that faces death on it. So Harbona, in, in these last two verses, he informs the king that Haman had prepared a gallows. So, hey, he, he knows what's going on. Harbona does. And this gallows was for Mordecai. And he points out, he wants to make sure that the king understands that this is the same Mordecai. This is the guy that saved your life. I mean, this is fresh in the king's mind. This is so fresh. I mean, it was that very morning that he had, that the king had been informed, reading through the Chronicles and being reminded of Mordecai's actions. It was that very day that Mordecai had been honored. And so it's all fresh in his mind. And Harbon is saying, hey, this was built for this guy that saved your life. And so it makes it all the easier for the king to finally finally make a decision. Re remember that we just tonight have talked about this idea, the fact that uh, here you have the king who refused to make a decision almost to a fault, had refused to make a decision, was so dependent on advisors for so many things. And finally, you see, finally, at this crucial moment, he makes a decision all by himself. Well, you know, it's almost like a little kid. I do it all by myself. And, and so finally, the king makes this decision, hang Haman on the gallows that was made for uh, Mordecai. It's a spike. Hey, yeah, Mike is a nerd. I'm reading some comments, folks. I keep getting distracted. You know, we've got an argument about if it's impaled or hanged or it's a spike. It's a wood. It's a it's a long wooden stake. So, um, yeah. All right. So hopefully you guys got all the notes here. I've got some final thoughts to share with you. Uh, before we leave this one, uh, the irony of pride. Um, 
I thought it was interesting. There's a uh, verse in Proverbs uh, chapter 26, verse 27. It says, whoever digs a pit will fall into it and a stone will come back to whoever starts it rolling. I don't know about you guys, but that sure sounds like Haman. You know, he had started all of these things in motion. It all came back and, and got him instead. And so, uh, yeah, again, he, he got what he had coming in a lot of ways. All right, final thoughts. Haman's humiliation. So the man who sought power and recognition was forced to honor the one man who would not bow. After parading Mordecai through the city, Haman hid his head in shame. Then his head is covered as a sign of condemnation in this chapter that we've read tonight. The device Haman commissioned to be the instrument of Mordecai's death now becomes his. Haman versus Mordecai. I think this is uh, another yeah, another quote from Tomasino. I quote him a lot. It says that Mordecai, this is interesting. Again, you know, you have this contrast. We've had so many contrasts in this book. Mordecai would not bow, nor would he stand, nor would he tremble before Haman. If you remember the, the verse, chapter 3 and chapter 5 really pointed that out. And instead, Haman, who wanted to have all of this honor, Haman is forced to tremble then to stand, then to bow. The Jew could not be forced to humiliate himself before the Amalekite, even by the order of the king, but the Amalekite humiliates himself before a Jew without compulsion. Um, you know, that's, it just, it shows that irony. It shows the, the, the result of pride, especially in Haman's experience here. Um, one of the things I've enjoyed about this book as we come to the last slide for the evening, is so many of the contrasts, so many of the things that we have seen that point to Jesus, that point to the influence of God throughout the book. And so uh, this is another one here. Uh, Haman deserved the humiliating death he received while Jesus did not. Haman, filled with pride, went unwillingly to, from wealth power and influence to death on a wooden stake or a tree. Jesus went willingly from his position of power and strength to one of humble humiliation to experience death on a cross or a tree. So again, there's these interesting parallels that play out here. Esther does well to risk her own life to save herself and her people. Remember that we talked about that in chapter five, but the sacrifice of the Messiah was far greater in that he was willing to give up his life also, but for him, he was willing to give it up for his enemies. And finally, the divine influence. This is uh, Thomasino one last time as we finish up tonight. It has long been recognized that human divine interaction is a main theme of Esther. God creates opportunities, but Esther must act on them. It is a pattern that God repeats throughout Scripture and throughout history. While Yahweh initiates the work of deliverance, there is also the human response required. God will part the Red Sea, but Moses must raise the staff. God will destroy the walls of Jericho, but the Israelites must blow the horns. God sends Jesus Christ to make the way of salvation, but humanity must still respond by placing faith in him. I think those are some important lessons for us to remember. Um, certainly tonight, I think that we see uh, exactly what happens when somebody, it, when they live their life according to this vain pride uh, that we see Haman. You know, this it's not necessarily that everybody that has a great amount of pride is going to face the same fate. But I think that we recognize that it is destructive. It is uh, self-serving. It is anti uh, Christian is certainly not a something that we should hold to, and and so uh, I think there's some important uh, lesson lessons for us in this chapter. So I really appreciate you guys. I know there wasn't as much interaction as we would normally have, um, and man, I'm really disappointed that we had some issues with the the stream tonight. But I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. It really has been uh, enjoyable. I really uh, really liked studying through Esther. I did want to mention we've only got two more lessons uh, before we finish this up and, and then I'm looking for a Bible book to study 
uh, to carry on Wednesday nights after that. So if you guys are interested in a specific book that you'd like to study, uh, if you could put that in the comments, uh, just so I could go back and, and see what you guys are interested in. I have a book in mind. I'm not sure it's uh, the most appropriate for, uh, for where we're at right now. It could take a long time too, uh, but I, I would love to hear what you guys have to say. So I uh, really appreciate it, and uh, we're going to close in a word of prayer, and then we're going to be dismissed. Father, we come to you tonight. We're so grateful, Lord, for your presence. And Lord, we're so grateful for the things and uh, how you orchestrated the events in this book, Lord, and, and influenced so many things for your people. Father, uh, I, I just pray that you would convict us, Lord, that you would uh, be in our hearts and, and just point out the times where maybe we're letting our own pride uh, just take too much of us, just influence us too much, Lord. I just pray that we would re be reminded to turn our faces back to you. And Lord, I just pray that we would trust in you and that we would depend on your your guidance, your word. And Lord, we just ask that you would do that for us. Lord, I just ask that you would bless the, the homes that make up this church, Lord, this, this greater church family. And Lord, I just pray that you would give us patience, Lord, as we wait on uh, getting back to normal, Father. I just pray that we won't rush back and we won't get too frustrated by it. Lord, we thank you and we are so grateful. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hope you guys have a great week. We will see you Sunday morning at 1030. Have a great rest of the week.